God is good. All right, I got to get y'all ready. I say God is good, you say all the time, then we reverse it. You ready? God is good. All the time. There you go. All the time. That's true. We don't think so. We don't feel like it, and the circumstances don't dictate it. God is still good all the time. This has been quite a service. We've had a lot going on, so buckle your seatbelts because I'm going to talk really, really fast. And if you don't get it, I apologize up front. We've got a lot to cover. This is a kind of a training day, so this is more of a teaching message than a preaching message, and uh, we're going to go really fast. So uh, we're going to be talking about being an on-mission Christian. I'm going to give you lots of illustrations and lots of ideas. I hope you'll stay for lunch because what I spoke on last time was conversational evangelism, and we talked about uh, the story, and we talked about the Three Circles Life Conversation Guide. I'm going to show you this afternoon how to use your phones, how to use your computers, how to use Facebook, how to use Twitter, how to engage people in conversations. We're going to do all that in the afternoon session, so uh, be aware of that. And what we're going to talk about right now is being an all-mission Christian in our daily life. My website has lots of free resources, Marty Dupree. Just go to the resources, and uh, we'll jump in. Remember, also, we have a team going to Armenia tomorrow. Uh, Alice Davis, myself, and Scott Yao from our association are going with seven people to Armenia, and we'll be there till March the 6th. So keep us in prayer. There's my family. I have five children, a daughter-in-law and a son-in-law, and a baby Adeline will be a year old on March 1st. Having all these kids will increase your prayer life, let me tell you. But it's been a joy. Well, let me tell you kind of a fun story, and then we'll get started. There's this little girl, and she and her grandmother have memorized the Lord's Prayer. The little kids are going to line up at church. They're going to do the Lord's Prayer. Grandma's all excited. She is fired up. So they're driving to church, and the little girl looks over to Grandma and says, Grandma, you know something? You and God have a lot in common. Well, she began to polish her spiritual halo, and she said, What's that, honey? And she said, You're both real old. <laughs> so they get to church, and they line the little kids up, and the first little boy that starts off, he doesn't get it right. He goes, Our Father who does art in heaven, Halloween be his name. And he goes right on. He doesn't get it right. But the little girl, she's next, and she's word perfect until she gets to the part where she says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. That's not what she said, but her theology was good. She said, Forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those that put trash in our baskets. I like that. And then she ended it by saying, And deliver us from email. <laughs> Taking her idea, though, forgive us our trash baskets, I want to give you an idea. Jesus is the greatest garbage man of all time. Amen? He's also the greatest doctor, lawyer, plumber, electrician. Doesn't matter what it is. Because Jesus is perfect, he's going to be the greatest. So let me tell you a story. We live in a neighborhood about halfway between Raleigh and Fuquay. When we moved into our neighborhood uh, 19 years ago, my oldest son for his RA mission project surveyed our whole neighborhood and gave out the Jesus video and found out that only... Uh, nine families out of the 34 homes in our neighborhood went to church on a regular basis. So we realized right away that our neighborhood was a mission field. Your neighborhood is a mission field. The neighborhood around this church is a mission field. Ten years later, my younger son resurveyed the neighborhood and gave out uh, a testimony of one of our neighbors, a retired Army guy that I had the privilege of baptizing. And we saw, found out that only 17 families went to church on a regular basis. So over a period of 10 years, we saw God do some things. But I want you to know it was more answer to prayer than anything else. That's why we need to be in an attitude of prayer and ask God to open our spiritual eyes. As you drive around town and as you go to work and as you come to church, let certain things be prayer prompts for you because so many times we just go the normal route. We know everything. But ask God to open your eyes. When you pass by the school, pray for the students and teachers uh, that God would use those who are uh, Christians to be winsome and bold to share their faith and engage people in conversations. Pray for the hearts of those that don't know the Lord. And then also, when you see an American flag, pray for our leaders, pray for our president, pray for our, our country. And today I really ask you specifically to pray for the Billy Graham family. Uh, the gospel is going out right now more probably than any time in all of history. WRAL yesterday uh, showed two hours of just Billy Graham sermons in the morning. It's amazing. This is the greatest opportunity possibly in the history of all time for the gospel to be going out this entire week because heads of state and people from all over the world are going to be uh, attending or watching or being aware of the funeral. And news media has given Billy Graham favor. They're showing the gospel. So be aware of that and be praying about that. So let me tell you um, a story. I was jogging in my neighborhood uh, one Tuesday morning. I jog a couple days a week and pray for my neighbors. You've heard of people committing drive-by slayings. I want to encourage you to commit drive-by prayings, amen, as you go. And so I, I saw our garbage man. I'd not met him before, but he had his name tag on it. said, TC. I said, TC, good morning. I said, TC, does that stand for terrific Christian? 
He goes, no, man, no, but it should. I said, well, TC, let me ask you something. Do you know who the greatest garbage man of all time is? He goes, now, that's an interesting question. You've got to explain that to me. I said, well, TC, you come each week, and you take away our garbage and our trash and remove it. We don't have to see it or deal with it again, and I appreciate that. He said, well, you're welcome. I said, but in the same way, Jesus Christ is the greatest garbage man of all time because he can come into our life, take away the garbage and the trash and the sin, and he can remove it so we don't have to see it or deal with it again. He goes, that's good. That's real good. I need to tell other people that. That's what I want you to do is tell other people that. And so keep that in mind. You can take the conversations and be very creative with them as you engage people. Whatever their profession is, uh, you can think up of an idea how Jesus would be the greatest, and, it, and it's pretty fun. I was jogging another time, and uh, I saw we had a new garbage man. I was put up some ideas here. Um, now, you've all been in this situation I'm about to describe, and here's the situation. It's not your garbage man, but it could be anybody. You, you come a, across a person, and, and as you see this person, you're thinking, in one side of your brain's thing, I ought to invite them to church, I ought to give them a Bible, I ought to give them a gospel track, I ought to tell them I'm praying for them. That's one side of your brain. The other side of your brain's thinking, they're going to think I'm crazy, they're, they're going to reject me, they're not going to understand what I'm saying. Well, when I saw our new garbage man, I was thinking all those things because he looked like he might be his, Hispanic. So I jogged on by. When I came up, we were face to face. I said, good morning. He said, good morning. I said, what's your name? He said, my name is Rich. I said, my name is Marty. Nice to meet you. Where are you from? He goes, well, originally I'm from Puerto Rico, but I moved here from New York City. I said, okay, well, good. I said, well, Rich, I said, um, do you know the greatest garbage man of all time is? And he just kind of looked at me like, that is the weirdest question in the world. And I'm already thinking in the back of my mind, this is not working. So um, I said, it's Jesus Christ. He's the greatest garbage man of all time. And he just looked at me like, okay, what planet did you just get off of? And I'm like, okay, Lord, this didn't work at all. So as I, I said, well, I hope that encouraged you. Maybe I'll see you again sometime. And he just kind of nodded at me like, you are a lunatic. And so I, I jog on. So the next week, he drives into the neighborhood, and Pastor Daniel, it kind of shocked me. He stopped the truck right when he got up to him. He jerked his glove off and stuck his hand out and said, man, I just want to tell you, thank you for what you said to me last week. Nobody's ever said anything like that to me before. I was thinking to myself, by the look on your face, I know that nobody had ever said anything like that to you before. But we struck up a friendship, and I would see him once a month, and we'd talk for three or four minutes. And um, Christmas came around, found out he had a Catholic background, talked about that. Easter, the movie, The Passion of the Christ, came out and talked about that. One day he told me his little boy's name was Stephen, and I said, Stephen, that means crowned one. Have you ever read about Stephen in the Bible? He said, no, where is it? I said, it's at the end of Acts chapter 6, going into chapter 7. Stephen was the first martyr that was recorded. Really? Talked about that. One day I'm signing up Darcy, my middle daughter, for school, and I'm looking at this guy, and, and uh, I'm thinking, that looks like my garbage man. He raises up, it's my garbage man. He goes, Marty, what are you doing here? And I said, my daughter Darcy, she goes to school here. What about you? And he said, my son Stephen, he's getting ready to start the first grade. And he goes, I clean up pretty good, don't I? He's all dressed up. And I said, yeah, man, you look great. Why do I take the time to tell you this story? Here's the reason. Every one of us, all of you, we have people in the natural path of our life, whether it's at the grocery store or the hairdresser or the barber shop, you know, wherever it is that you go, you've got people you see once a week, once a month, and you have five-minute conversations with them. And we normally talk about the weather. We talk about the ball game last night or whatever's going on in the news. There's nothing wrong with that. But I want to encourage you today. I want to challenge you today and even train you some on how do you engage people in conversations and talk about Jesus. Amen? We live in a culture that's not really interested in church and probably not coming, but they're interested in Jesus. They're interested in the Bible. There's so many things going on in our world right now that people are asking lots of questions. People want to know the truth. I love what uh, Garrett said about grace and truth. You and I want to be gracious, but we want to bring them to the truth of God's word. You and I are not the confrontation. The gospel is the confrontation. You and I want to be winsome so that we, in fact, may win some. But you and I are not the evangelist. God is the evangelist through the power of the Holy Spirit, and God will use us in that process. We'll talk about personalities and that kind of thing this afternoon in our session, but just keep that in mind that, that God wants people to be reached with the gospel, and we just need to be creative. How many of y'all have a name that's in the Bible? Your name's in the Bible. What's your name? Michael. Michael. It means who is like God. It's a question mark. Daniel. I'm going to tell a story about Daniel in just a minute. Somebody else, your name's in the Bible. Yes, sir. Philip. Philip means horse lover, but Philip is one of my favorite characters in the Bible because he was the evangelist Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. I might mention that in just a minute. Well, anyway, yes, sir. What's your name? David, beloved of God. And uh, somebody else raised their hand. Salmon. Salmon. Salmon's in the Bible too. And in the lineage, there you go. All right, here's a perfect example. If somebody gives you a name and you don't know what it means, that's fine. Just say, hey, have you ever, ever read about yourself in the Bible? I was in a, a restaurant in Cary one time, and our waiter came up. His name was Daniel. 
not your, not your pastor. And I said, Daniel, I said, that's a great biblical name. I said, you know what your name means? No, sir. This guy's about 21 years old, college age. I said, it means God is my judge. I said, he said, really? And I said, yeah. I said, have you ever read about Daniel in the Bible? No, sir. I said, man, he's got these friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I said, they get thrown in a fire. They're walking around in the fire. They come out of the fire. They don't even get burned. They don't even smell like smoke. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy. And I said, I know that sounds crazy, but that's in the Bible. I said, and Daniel, he gets thrown in a lion's den. He falls asleep. Lions fall asleep. And when they come to get him out, the lions eat the people that threw him in. He's looking at me like I'm crazy now. And I'm like, man, that's all in the Bible. I didn't make it up. And that's just the first half of Daniel. The second half is about end times and the second coming. He goes, really? And I said, yeah. I said, you might have to read about that. He said, yeah, I might have to read about that in the Bible. And see what I'm doing in my conversation. I'm leading him to the Bible, to read the Bible for himself. Because what you and I say might be inspirational, but it's not inspired by God. But God's word is inspired by God and has the ability to transform lives and change hearts. And that's what we want to happen. So just look for ways to connect. Look for something you have in common. If they got on a Carolina hat and you like Carolina, then go Tar Heels. If they got on a state hat, you can say, hey, I can get you a blue one if you want it. And then you're into a fun conversation. So <clears throat> there you go. I'm glad you all saw the humor in that. We're... <laughs> We're not talking about prayer today as much as we probably should, but I want you to know that nothing happens without the power of prayer. You and I have zero power, but God has all the power, and that's the resource that we want to tap into. So keep in mind as you go that you're, on, you're praying as you go. You're praying for people, praying for their souls. Now, when we talk about evangelism, a lot of times somebody says, we're going to do evangelism. Sounds like we're going to go out and hit somebody in the head with a Bible. We're going to get them in a headlock and tell them where they go if they don't straighten out. We all know that's not the way to win friends and influence enemies. Amen. Look at the word with me for just a minute. It literally means sharing the good news, but let's break this down. I don't know if this will shine on there. All right, this will fade off there. All right, look at the word evangelism. In Greek, it's euangelion. The E-V is actually E-U, and it means good. And then right in the middle of the word evangelism is the word angel. It means the message or the messenger. So literally, it means the good news or the good message. For example, if you all remember the story of Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch, the eunuch is driving along in his chair, and he's bouncing, and he's reading Isaiah out loud, and Philip runs up to him and said, Hey, do you understand what you're reading? He said, How could I unless somebody explains it to me? The Bible says in Acts 8.35, beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. But what it literally says in Greek is he euangelized him, he evangelized him with Jesus. Literally, he good newsed him with Jesus. And folks, we've got to recapture that, that evangelism is good newsing people. And true evangelism is an act of compassion, not an act of aggression. It's caring about somebody's soul. So much of our ideas of evangelism have been confrontational. You walk up to somebody and you say, hey, can I tell you how you become a Christian? Well, you do that today and say, hey, man, don't judge me. How do you know what I believe? Or if you walk up to somebody and say, the Bible says, they might say, hey, I don't believe the Bible. And you're kind of dumb. But if you just walk up to somebody and say, hey, what's your name? Garrett, nice to meet you. Garrett, where are you from? And, and then you might ask them a, a more gentle question, which I taught you all last time was, hey, do you have any particular spiritual beliefs? And then let them talk. Remember we talked about the three-story method? You listen to their story. Tell them your story. Tell them his story. That's a conversational process. Just keep that in mind. But let me tell you a, a story that is realistic to how this process takes place. I coach baseball. This is my 20th season of baseball. I love baseball. And um, I was coming off the field in Garner one day uh, on a Saturday. It was about lunchtime. This homeless guy came up. His name's Michael. He's about 19 years old, but he was homeless. And he came up and he said, hey, man, can you give me some money to get something to drink? We well, don't give homeless people money to get something to drink. But I said, when's the last time you had something to eat? He said, well, it's been a while. I said, well, my son and I, we're going to get some lunch. Why don't you go with us? And my son said, let's go to Arby's. And Michael said, Arby's would be good. <laughs> so I get him in the car with me. We, I went through the drive-thru so I could keep him with me longer. We began to talk. I began to witness to him. He goes, man, I don't believe all that. I heard all that in the homeless shelter. I said, why don't you believe it? He said, because there's a bunch of hypocrites in church. I said, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of hypocrites in church. There's also a lot of hypocrites that don't go to church too. Amen. It's kind of like that bumper sticker that says motorcycles are everywhere. We ought to have one that says hypocrites are everywhere because they are. <laughs> so if somebody throws up a smoke screen of some sort or another, if you can agree with them, just agree and then let them talk and then move on to what you want to. If you don't agree, just hear them out and then talk about what you want to anyway. So uh, we talked for a little bit and I said, well, Michael, can I pray for you? And he goes, he looked at me odd like, well, I guess so. So I prayed for him. He opens the door and he gets out of the car and he kind of stands there for just a minute. Then he sits back down in the car and he lets me talk to him. And when he got out and left and my son and I were driving away, my son said, Dad, why did he get back in the car? I said, well, I think he figured out a couple of things. One, we weren't trying to do anything to him. We weren't trying to get anything from him. We weren't judging him. We were just trying to tell him about Jesus. On top of that, we bought his lunch. But you see that process that's going on there? When you start to talk about something spiritual, people are already backing up. They're kind of waiting to see 
if you're going to preach to them. And when you just engage them in a conversation and it's back and forth one-on-one, -on -one, they're open to that. And I told you a lot of illustrations last time, and I'll give you, give you more as we move forward here. But here's another principle. By the way, that's, that's the first principle I want you to think about. And you've got a sheet that's got all this written on it, that true evangelism is an act of compassion, not an act of aggression. All right, here's another one. We tend to see people by our human nature as either scenery or machinery. But we need to see them as a soul with an eternal destiny. I call this being soul conscious. Scenery is what do they look like? Are they tall? Are they short? Do they have blue hair, spiked hair, earrings, or tattoos, or whatever? And, you know, and we kind of make an assessment about them. That's our human nature. But, folks, we've got to change the question. The question isn't what do they look like or what can they do, machinery. The question is what's the condition of their heart, and do they know Jesus as their Savior? And that changes our whole perspective on how we deal with people. Y'all might remember there's a contemporary Christian song by Brandon Heath called, Lord, Give Me Your Eyes. And in that song is basically a prayer. He's asking God to help him to see people as God sees them. And folks, that changes our perspective of how we deal with people if we can begin to see them as God sees them and see them from the inside out, not just from the outside in. Now, let me give you a couple illustrations. This works two ways. One is how we approach people, but also how we evaluate our own ability to share the gospel with them. Sometimes we'll see somebody and we'll think, man, they don't want to hear what i got to say. God's never going to change them. They've been like this forever. Well, you can't say that because you don't know. When God gets a hold of somebody's life and heart, He can change them and transform them into what He wants them to be. And then a lot of times we don't really know what's going on. But let me give you just a couple examples. Y'all remember David in the Bible. What was David before he was a king? Shepherd boy, that's right. All right, well, Saul uh, was not doing a great job, and Samuel was going to replace Saul as king. And so he told Jesse, who had a lot of sons, bring in all your sons. And he goes... Nope, he's not the one. Nope, he's not the one. Nope, he's not the one. Don't you have another son? He said, oh, yeah, I got David. He's a shepherd. Well, he's out with the sheep. He said, well, bring him in. He goes, he's the one. That's God's anointed. See, everybody saw David as a shepherd boy, but God saw him as a king. And, folks, we, we could be talking to the highest of the higher or the lowest of the low, but when God transformed their life, there's no telling what can happen to them. Now I'm going to give you a more modern-day story, and you're going to know this as I tell it. Back in the 1920s, there was a great evangelist called Mordecai Ham. He was well-known. He preached all over the United States. And he did two weeks of revival in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was like the sawdust tent revival. Well, one particular night, uh, one of his friends asked him how it went. And he said, well, it wasn't that big a night. It wasn't that great a night. We just had one teenage boy saved. That one teenage boy was a 17-year-old son of a dairy farmer named Billy Graham. That great evangelist evaluation of the night was that that wasn't that big a deal. He had no idea who Billy Graham was. And yesterday... From Asheville, North Carolina to Charlotte, North Carolina, every, by, every overpass that their motorcade went had flags and fire trucks and people. Jonathan Lotz and Graham Lotz's son sent me a, a picture of all the different places as they were traveling from Asheville to Charlotte. It's amazing to think how this man is one of only four people that's going to lie in repose in the Capitol being honored. I mean, God's used this man to speak and preach and teach the gospel more than anything else. So here's my point. Don't ever under-evaluate the impact of your witness to share the gospel with somebody. Amen? Keep that in mind. Let me, let me tell you this, because look, look right here. If this is the cross, sometimes we, we're, we're, we're harvesting, sometimes we're cultivating, and sometimes we're just sowing the seed. We're going to talk more about that. But keep that in mind. It's a process of moving people towards the cross. We'll, I'll talk more about this this afternoon. My glasses have decided to uh, attack my microphone. <laughs> now, look at this statement here, and I'll unpack this a little bit. Southern Baptists are a harvest-minded denomination living in an unseated generation. Chuck Kelly said this, and then I heard him preach on it again and said, he's worried that we're no longer harvest-minded. We're not as worried about seeing people come to Christ as we used to be. But being harvest-minded is a good thing, and what it means is we want to see people come to know Christ Join the church, be involved in ministry. Now, many of y'all, like me, grew up in the 70s and 80s. You got used to seeing people every Sunday come down the aisle, join the church. There was activity. We don't see that as much anymore. Now, back to my illustration I was giving you. If this is the cross, some people are ready to be harvested and respond to the gospel. When you ask them, are you ready to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? They'll come to Christ. But more people in our culture need to be cultivated. They need to get their questions answered. They need to be in the teaching or the preaching of the gospel. And then far more people over here, they need to see song. They need to, you love them, you're praying for them, you've invited them to church, you've given them a gospel tract, which I call a Bible study, or something. So whether we're sowing or cultivating or harvesting, all that's an equally important, a process of bringing people to Christ. 
I was coming out of a, a, a parking garage in Raleigh downtown one time, and I came up to pay my ticket, and I saw these two young girls. They're about 19 or 20, and they're just droopy. I mean, they look like they were hung over from the night before. Or they're sad or lost their last friend. I don't know. My, my old pastor, Dr. Hugh Garner, called it sad dancing and slow singing. He said that's what they look like, sad dancing and slow singing. Well, anyway, all I was going to do was sow a seed. I was just going to give her a card, like Daniel talked about earlier. I was just going to give her a card and sow a seed. That's all I was going to do. But she came to the window, and I started handing her my ticket. She had her name tag on it. It's kind of wacky-jawed, and it said Angie. I said, Angie, is that short for Angela? She said, yeah, that's my real name. I said, that's my wife's name. Do you know what it means? No, what's it mean? I said, it means an angel or a messenger. Well, folks, you thought I'd plug her in an electric socket. She goes, hey, Dee, did you hear that? I'm an angel. I'm a messenger. It came to life. And so uh, I said, here's your little card. It's got a Bible verse on one side and a prayer on the other. I hope it encourages you today. That's all I was going to do. She put her hands on her hips and she cocked her head sideways. She said, somebody's trying to say something. And when God's at work, you don't have to kick the door down. I said, who's trying to say something to you? She pointed up like that. I said, you want to talk about that? And she said, yes, sir, but you, you may not have time again. I said, well, ma'am, I may never see you again. Let me just back in and I'll, I'll pull back around and so I came back up, and she looked at me, and she said, Sir, you're the third person in 24 hours to say something to me about the Lord. I heard the Twilight Zone music then. Do, 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 do. Okay, God, you're up to something. She, she held up this little booklet and said, The first person left me this little booklet, Our Daily Bread. She said, The second person left me this little booklet that says, Do you know for certain that you have eternal life, and you'll go to heaven when you die? I said, Can I see that a minute? And I looked on the back. Mount Vernon Church in North Raleigh. I said, can I share this with you? Oh, yes, sir, please share this with me. She was very animated by this time. I said, Deidre, you need to hear this as much as I do. Sir, she needs to hear as much as I do, but you don't need me to run a cast right out of me. So she came out, and I began to go through the book. God loves you, has a plan for you, John 3, 16, second principle. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. When I got to the third principle about Jesus being God's only payment and provision for our sin, she just starts weeping. I said, are you all right? She said, oh, i got some stuff in my life. And she told me. She was very honest, too honest. And I said, well, I appreciate your honesty. Thank you for telling me that. And she said, but going on here, I said, well, the, the last thing in John 1.12, the fourth principle is that we must individually respond to him and receive him. In John 1.12, it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Yes, sir. And she's still weeping. And I showed her the prayer, read the prayer, what we call the prayer of repentance, the sinner's prayer. And I said, Angie, is this what's on your heart? Yes, sir. I said, are you ready to pray right now? Oh, no, sir. No, sir. I can't pray right now. I've got to deal with all this stuff in my life. I said, Angie, I said, you don't have to clean up to come to God. I said, when you surrender your life to him, he will clean you up and he will turn all that around. I said, let me tell you my story. I said, there was a time when I was similar to you. I was 18 inches away from heaven. And what I mean by that is I knew in my head what I needed to do, but in my heart I had not surrendered. I said, and I was under conviction. I was 13 years old. It was right before I started eighth grade. And uh, I was reading the Bible one night. I was reading in the Gospel of John. And I came under conviction that I needed to do something with Jesus. So I talked to my mom. She made an appointment with a pastor. And he went through the four spiritual laws with me. And he asked me, Marty, you know God loves you and has a plan for you? Yes, sir. You know that you're a sinner and your sin separates you? Yes, sir. Do you know that Jesus is God's only payment provision for your sin? Yes, sir. Are you ready to pray and ask him into your heart? Yes, sir. And I prayed with the pastor. I said, but Angie, the pastor had some incredible wisdom and insight. Because even though I agreed in my mind with everything he said and everything I needed to do, I would not really surrendered in my heart. And the pastor said to me, now, Marty, I want you to go home and pray your own prayer in your own words and surrender your life to him. And that night, two days before I started eighth grade, I still felt like an elephant was sitting on me when I went home that night because I had not really surrendered my life. But that night when I really did pray, I really did ask Christ in my life and I surrendered my life to him, I felt like I floated off the bed. Now, I didn't float at all. I was laying flat on my back, but I had such a relief and a lightness. And then I kind of had this warm, confident feeling that I now understand was God's spirit coming in my life. And that happened almost 40 years ago, and I've never gotten over it. And that's why I'm telling you about it now. As I told Angie, and she said, yes, sir, yes, sir, thank you, sir, thank you, sir. I said, Angie, can I pray for you? Oh, please pray for me. So I prayed for her that God would forgive her. He'd set her free. He'd cleanse her. He'd make her his own. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, sir. I needed that. Thank you, sir. And as I was walking away, the Holy Spirit just gave me this question or statement. And I looked at her and I said, Angie, I hope I'll see you in heaven someday. And she looked at me and she said, you will, sir. You will. And folks, every one of us, you've got Angie's in your life every day. They're divine appointments. They're people that you come in contact with. You don't know where they are in that process of coming to Christ and Maybe nobody's talked to them. Maybe a lot of people talk to them. You just don't know where they are. But our role and our goal is to move them towards the cross. And uh, that's a powerful thing when you think about that, um, that we have those opportunities. But the thing I like about the question that the Holy Spirit put on my heart was, I hope I'll see you in heaven someday. I didn't falsely commit her to heaven. 
I didn't condemn her to hell. I just left it with her. She's got to respond to Jesus. Amen? And all of us have to. So I hope that you've made that response where you know that you know that you know that you've had that moment of conversion in your life. Now I want you to see something here. Daryl Robinson said that any witness given of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit leaving the results to God is a successful witness. Amen? It's all about the Holy Spirit. Folks, you and I are not the evangelist. God is the evangelist through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're the messenger. We're the mouthpiece. We're the carriers. We're the vessels of the gospel. But God's the one that saves people, but he wants us to tell them about it. That's the, the key thing. Now, I want to back up and just say something about being an unseated generation. We talked a lot about this when I was here last time, about the nuns, the N-O-N-E nuns. That means they have no religious preference whatsoever. That's the fastest growing group of people. 65% of the people in Harnett County have no affiliation with anybody. But talking about being unseated, let me give you an illustration of that. I went into a Verizon store, like an Alltel store, Verizon store one time, and there was a young fellow in there. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. I was getting a headset for my telephone, which I need to do that again. And, um, <laughs> and so I go in, he's reading a book, and he just lays his book down puts it on the counter. And it's 8 o'clock in the morning. He and I are the only ones in there. His name was Brian. I said, Brian, where are you from? He said, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Where'd you go to school? East Carolina University. This is a North Carolina boy through and through, your next door neighbor, Joe College kind of guy. I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, um, Brian, I said, do you have a church background? He looked at me and he goes, no, sir, I've never been to church. That really caught me off guard. I said, really, you've never been to church? I said, what about weddings or funerals? He said this, none of my friends are married yet. None of my friends have died. I've never been to church. So I said to myself, okay, Mr. Evangelism, dude, now what do you say? So I asked him my favorite question. Well, do you ever think about spiritual things? And he reaches under and he pulls out the book he's reading and he holds the book up. And the title of the book was Bible Basics for Dummies. I heard the Twilight Zone music again. Do, 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 do. Okay, I was like, okay, God, you're up to something here. Um, he did not go to a Christian bookstore and get that book. He went to Barnes & Noble or Books a Million or wherever books are sold and right beside Computer Basics for Dummies was Bible Basics for Dummies and that's what he was reading when I walked in. Then I asked him, I said, well, Brian, I said, have you ever heard of Billy Graham? He said, oh, everybody in North Carolina has heard of Billy Graham. I thought to myself, au contraire, mon frere, most people under 30 have not heard of Billy Graham, but I'm glad you have. So I pulled out one of my favorite little Bible studies. I don't call them tracts or pamphlets or whatever. That sounds so cultic. I said, here's a little Bible study called Steps to Peace with God. It's written by Billy Graham. Most of you all are familiar with this illustration. It shows how, if this is God, how we try to reach God through being good or being religious or going to church or having a good philosophy, how all that falls short, but how God reaches back to us through the cross of Christ which is the bridge analogy that's on these cards that, that Daniel's put together, which are great. And, um, and so as I explained it to him, he was very open. He listened to everything I had to say, read the prayer to him. He didn't respond, but he was open to everything I had to say. And I encouraged him to read the Bible for himself, not just to read a book about the Bible. And he said, I need to do that. Now, rewind my story. Was Brian thinking about church? Not at all. Was he planning to go to church? Not at all. Was he interested in the Bible? Absolutely. He wasn't reading the Bible, but he's reading a book about the Bible. That's our culture today. That's where our people are at. We're in an unseated generation, and we need to engage people. They want to talk. They're open. They're just probably not going to come to church. I probably said this last time. We in America and most of the churches, we do church like a man fishing in the middle of a lake without a fishing rod, yelling at the fish to jump in the boat. <laughs> it's not impossible, but it's real unlikely. It's like, y'all come, y'all come. Well, that's probably not going to happen, and here's the reason. For somebody who's never been to church, just to walk in these doors, that's like you or I walking down the street, pick a house that you don't know who lives there, walk on the front porch, open the door and walk in. You're not going to do that. But if you did do that, you'd be extremely uncomfortable, amen? That's what it's like for somebody just to show up at church on their own. It happens occasionally. People will come to church if you invite them, but you've got to walk in with them. You've got to meet them at their house or Hardy's McDonald's and walk in with them. So we're in an unseated generation. Now... We need to, to move quickly. I'm going to hit this really quick. We're going to look at Matthew 28, but we're going to do it in hyperspeed. Y'all are very familiar with the Great Commission. Garrett mentioned that this morning. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Amen? That's where this passage gets to. But let me give you a context and tell you a little bit about this as we move towards that very quickly. This is Easter Sunday morning. Jesus has just been crucified. He's been put in a borrowed tomb. Earthquake takes place. It rolls away the stone. Um, the angel appears to the soldiers. They fall out like dead men. And then all these ladies named Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, they all show up at the grave. The angel appears to them, and this is what the angel says. Fear not, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. 
He is risen. Come and see the place where he was lying. Now, all the time you always meet an angel, they say, fear not or do not be afraid. I think they learned that in angel school on the first day. Isn't that what they always say? Fear not, because you'd be overwhelmed when you come into the presence of the divine being. We all would be. And he says, I know you're looking for Jesus. Now, they were looking for the physical body of Jesus, but I want to take this phrase for just a minute and say everybody is looking for Jesus. They may not say that. They may not use those words. But anytime somebody begins to think about God and wonder if there is a God, and the only way they're going to connect with Creator God is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? So people are really looking for Jesus. My wife and I try to go out on a date at least once a month, and with all these kids, you can understand she needs a break today other than McDonald's. Amen? And so we were at a Chili's restaurant in Garner. We had this waitress one time, and she just had an attitude. I mean, you can just tell when somebody's got an attitude. She just had an attitude, you know, just in a mood, a sporting attitude. And her name was Nikki. I said, Nikki, is that short for Nicole? Yeah. I said, you know what it means? Yeah. I said, it means victorious one. She said, I know. I know my grandmother gave me a card. I mean, she just had an attitude. I said, it was about Easter time. I said, Nikki, have you seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, which is a Christian movie? How many of y'all have seen The Passion of the Christ? A lot of you have. Well, that's what I asked her. That was my question. Have you seen the movie The Passion of the Christ? She puts her hands up back and goes, oh, I'm not religious. I don't go to church or anything. I said, well, I'm religious. I, I brush my teeth twice a day. And she said, no, you're sarcastic. And I'm thinking, no, girl, you're sarcastic. But anyway, I said, no, I'm not talking about being religious or anything. I'm just talking about what Jesus said and what he did on the cross. She steps back up and goes, oh, I'm interested in that. There's a cook. We've been having this conversation for several weeks now. Now, rewind my story. When I mentioned something spiritual, which was a Christian movie, her response was, I'm not religious. I don't go to church. And when I said I'm not really talking about religion, I'm talking about relationship. She said, oh, I'm interested in that. That's where we're at. That's where our culture is. They're not really looking for religion. They don't even believe in organized religion, especially if they don't go to church, but they're looking for Jesus. Amen? Now, the angel tells the ladies to go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. Behold, I've told you. Now, here's what I want you to keep in mind very quickly. The angel is telling the ladies to tell the disciples to go to Galilee. But notice this phrase, going before you. There's nothing God's called this church to do or called your family to do, or called you as an individual to do, that he has not already gone before you. Amen? Now, he says, I'm going before you. And, uh, and it says, they, they departed from the, uh, the tomb with fear and great joy. They ran to report this to the disciples. And then, um, all of a sudden, Jesus is going to show up in verse 9. It says, Behold, Jesus met them, greeted them. They took hold of his feet. They worshipped him. And then verse 10, Jesus said, Do not be afraid. Go and take my word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. There they shall see me. Now, obviously, something very significant is getting ready to take place in Galilee because the angel told the ladies, tell the disciples, go to Galilee. Now, Jesus appeared probably on the road to Emmaus. Luke has a whole passage on this. Matthew just has two verses. Go to Galilee. Then you've got a little interlude. I call this the Jewish conspiracy uh, because in these verses it says, hey, just say that you told the soldiers. Just say you fell asleep. The disciples stole the body. We'll pay off the governor. That'll get you out of trouble. And it says many of the Jews believe this to this day. By the way, if you run into somebody who's Jewish, you can tell them you are too by adoption. Romans 11 talks about that. Now, we pick it back up. Angel told him to go to Galilee. Jesus told him to go to Galilee. And it says the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to a mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some were doubtful. Now, let me ask you a question. Think about this real quickly. Where are the disciples from? They're from Galilee. Where did they first meet Jesus? Galilee. Where'd they see him do a miracle with the fish and loaves? Galilee, mountainside in Galilee. What's going on here? Before Jesus sends them out with a great commission, go and make disciples of all the nations, he's calling these guys back home. He's calling them back to himself. He's calling them back to where they first met him and where they saw him do miracles. Why do you think? It's to give them a motivation and a passion and desire to do that. I pastored in the Hickory area before I came to work with the Baptist State Convention some years ago. We were getting ready to serve communion one day, and I called on one of our deacons. His name was Dean. He was 38 years old, good man, dependable, godly guy. And I said, Dean, before we serve the bread, why don't you pray for us? This was his prayer. Lord, thank you for saving my sorry lost soul. We love you, Jesus. Amen. That's all he said. Man, I got tears in my eyes and a lump in my throat, and our sanctuary was shaped like this. There wasn't a dry eye in the place because nobody thought a dean is sorry, and nobody thought a dean is lost. But Dean remembered 18 years earlier when he was lost, and he thanked God for saving his sorry lost soul. And folks, if you and I are honest, we could say and pray the same thing. It is a gracious act of God that he would save us, the Bible call us, the Bible says adopt us, and make us join heirs with Jesus. Isn't that an amazing thing? So 
That's what I think is going on in this passage. Jesus is reminding them of who he is so that when they go out, they're motivated and impassioned to do so. And then the part you're familiar with, the Great Commission, Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven on earth, the whole universe. And then our mandate is to go therefore and make disciples. The verb is make disciples. The, the adverbial participles are going, baptizing, and teaching. And it's literally a lifestyle that we're called to as you go, make disciples. Life is a mission trip. It's not just going to Armenia or doing vacation Bible school. Life is a mission trip. Say that out loud with me. Life is a mission trip. And I think that's what Daniel's really casting a vision for. And I love him and his heart for this. And I appreciate Garrett pointing that out this morning, that, that uh, we're to be on the go. We're to be on mission. Now, what is a disciple, uh, a follower of Christ who is reproducing fruit? That's the question. Are we reproducing ourselves? John 15, 8, Jesus said, you'll know that you're my disciples if you bear much fruit. In a book called Discipleship, Jim Putnam has this really good definition. A disciple is a follower of Christ, being changed by Christ, and on the mission of Christ. A lot of times that last phrase gets left out. We might be a believer and we might love Jesus, but are we on mission with him? Matthew 4, 19, when he calls the disciples, he says, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. That's the head, the heart, and the hands. Follow me, make a choice, I will make you, I'll transform your heart, fishers of men. It's the head, heart, and the hands. So a true disciple is going to be doing that. And then he says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Folks, there's all kinds of nations right here in Lillington. And then it says, baptizing them. Now, I want, you got a beautiful baptistry. When we think baptism, we think ceremony. That's my daughter, Darcy. She was nine years old. She's 23 now. She's been in eight or nine different countries on mission trips. She's a nurse at Duke now in surgical ICU. But you never know when you begin to pray what God's going to do to send you to be a missionary. Now, we see this. We think baptism. You've got a baptistry back here. Invite friends, family, grandma. But what about a Buddhist? What about a Hindu? What about a Muslim? When they see that word, make disciples, baptizing, they're not thinking ceremony. They're thinking, I'm to be public about my faith, even if it costs me something. Take a Muslim, for example. If they're baptized publicly, they may lose their life that day. And maybe not just them, maybe their whole family. Because it's against the law in like 40 countries in the Middle East and Central Asia to, to even be a Christian. So keep that in mind that we're to be public about our faith, even if it may cost us something. And then teaching them to observe. The word observe is a military word. It means to guard, to keep, to protect, to obey all that I suggested to you, you know, all that I commanded you. And then his promise, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I emphasize the I am because Jesus is saying, I, God in the flesh, will be with you when you do what it is I ask you to do. All right, we need to wrap this up. But a couple things about prayer. George Barna makes a statement that we do church a lot like a man in a race car with no gas. We got our plans and we do our stuff and we go out to try to accomplish something and we may or may not be able to accomplish it because maybe God's not in it. We need to be in line with what God wants us to do, filled with his spirit. And here's a statement about the supernatural nature of prayer by Evelyn Christensen. We have failed to sufficiently involve God through prayer in our soul-winning efforts. In our pre-evangelism praying, we ask the omnipotent, that means the all-powerful God of the universe, to reach down and work in people's lives before we do. And what a difference such praying makes. See, prayer is where our power comes from. This is the last illustration I'll give you. The purpose of the church is to glorify God. The mission of the church is to make disciples. And these are the missional activities of the church. We do evangelism. Uh, we do uh, worship, ministry and missions, fellowship, discipleship. I put administration because it means an order to minister, in this case the gospel. But what is a bow? I mean, what does an arrow need to be launched? It needs a bow. What do you think that bow might be? It's prayer. Now watch this. If you take prayer out of it, this is what we've been doing with the church in America. We've been taking this arrow in our hand, and we're trying to launch it. We may or may not accomplish our mission. We may or may not hit our target because we can only do what we're humanly able to do. But when we put the arrow in the hands of the archer, in this scenario is God, we begin to pray, and he begins to pull back the bow, he's not going to miss his target. And what does the Bible say is his target? Luke 19, 10, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. And that's what we're to be about. Not just to be about having a Kiwanis Club with a cross on top, but we're to be about on the go, on mission, to share Christ with everybody around us and to do it in a loving, in a winsome, and a compassionate way. Amen? That's what we're called to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here today or in the hearing of my voice that has never surrendered to Jesus for the first time, that today would be the day of surrender and salvation. Father, for all of us who know you, may we grow in your grace and knowledge. May we grow in boldness and may we be winsome to share our faith with others. Lord, we commit this time of response and reaction to you. Pray that you be glorified, that your kingdom purpose will be accomplished. Father, I pray that you'll be pleased, glorified, and magnified in all things. 
We commit this time of response to you. Have your way in our hearts and our lives and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand as uh, Kathy comes to lead us in music, this is a time to respond. But I want to invite you, come to this altar and pray for a friend or a relative or an associate at work or school or a neighbor uh, who doesn't know Christ or you're not sure if they know Christ. Be using this time to pray for them. Uh, we're going to get to talk and interact in the time after lunch. I'm looking forward to that. I'll teach you how to use some different uh, tools and skills. But um, maybe you're here today and you need to publicly profess Christ. Maybe you've asked Him in your heart, but you've never really told anybody, and maybe you need to share that with Pastor Daniel. Uh, but all of us probably need to surrender in a fresh way. But this is a moment to respond as the music begins. Join me at this altar. Pray for that person that God's put on your heart. You come now.